the week after uh, we successfully uh, uh, integrated uh, St. Stephen's Episcopal School, uh, I had uh, three telephone calls from three different people. And in that week, uh, St. Stephen's School lost $750,000 from these three people uh, who never again uh, contributed uh, a dollar to uh, St. Stephen's School. These people uh, also came to understand that this was going to be a costly thing, costly for them personally. They were going to lose friends over it. Uh, uh, but they also had to remember that uh, their Lord said, you know, I came to set people at variance with themselves, you know. When the chips are down and the issues have to do with human life and with justice and love, somebody's got to pay the cost. And if you're going to be this kind of person, you've got to be prepared to pay it. Uh, so there were people who uh, really did an about face and uh, paid the cost uh, uh, and, and stood up and were counted uh, when the time came. Isn't that a kind of an ongoing challenge to the church to increase the percentage of people who could undergo that kind of experience as opposed to the people who would simply turn their back and walk out? Well, I've always felt that this was the church's chief responsibility, uh, that its chief responsibility was not in putting names on the rolls. Uh, not simply in having going out and having people come into the church to be Episcopalians or Christians or what you would, uh, but rather was to confront uh, the fact that a professing Christian is one who is willing to take the risks in terms of love and justice and to pay the cost, uh, no matter whether the budget fails or whether the rolls go down or whether the fabric of the church decays. Uh, but the point is whether the witness is faithful to the gospel which both saves people and also coerces them in the best sense of the word. You went to Selma, Alabama also to march with uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. What was that experience like and did, did you consider it at the time a sort of uh, lobbying act on, on the part of uh, voting rights? Well, I went to march uh, at the time of the uh, uh, death of the Unitarian minister there, oh, yeah. uh, who was slain, uh, and uh, uh, I saw it as a responsibility uh, of the symbolic head of the Episcopal Church, the presiding bishop, uh, to indicate uh, that at least through the presiding bishop's office, uh, the church has a concern uh, about the black man and also the white man uh, in a situation in which there are conflicting uh, uh, points of view and opinions uh, about their status and about uh, dealing with liberty and, and freedom uh, and the dignity uh, of the human race. Uh, so uh, I went uh, primarily to say that uh, as far as this symbolic head of the Episcopal Church is concerned. The church has got to be concerned here and has got to do its best to make its witness. Sure. Uh, it was a, um, a frightening experience, but it was also uh, uh, one about which I had no regrets. However, it was not all bad because during those chaotic periods, the church, in a sense, for the first time since the early 30s and the grim depression years of the late 20s and early 30s began to see the issues in all their ugliness, began to see what was happening to black men, brown men in a society which prided itself as being democratic, equal, egalitarian, all of that business, began to see itself, the church, as being as racist an institution as many of the secular institutions, public education and so forth, which, had, which the Supreme Court had to desegregate. Church began to see itself, for those who had the eyesight and the courage to do it, as being one of the most segregated institutions of all of human life, and therefore guilty of racism. Now, most leadership that I see in churches uh, has fallen away from that aggressive, uh, uh, determined stance. Uh, they are uh, not as concerned to be out in front uh, in leadership roles uh, and uh, not concerned uh, too much to stick their neck out. They want to reconcile the church and uh, 
tighten and strengthen its fellowship and make it a more harmonious community, mm -hmm. uh, assuming that that reflects uh, Christian love. Well, it may. I doubt it. it need it be an either-or situation? In your opinion, if, if a, it's a church set about to deepen the spiritual life of, of, the, of a congregation, say, does that necessitate a withdrawal from that kind of activist approach which addresses itself to social wrong? Uh, certainly should not, Mr. Downs, as you well know. They are, uh, it, it, it's a, uh, uh, a division which people have made mm. and which does not stand in the great Christian, Judeo-Christian tradition at all. It's all one piece, back in front of the same coin, so to speak. Uh, but the difficulty uh, lies and the fact that to be engaged with the world costs somebody something. <laughs> yes. uh, to be engaged in the, uh, uh, the pietistic approaches to the life of the spirit, uh, while it may cost in terms of a personal discipline, uh, such as a monastic discipline or what you will, and be difficult to do, yeah. uh, it does not have the same cost as when the church confronts the world and challenges uh, the structures and the powers of the world where they live and where they are and runs the risks the church does under these circumstances of being both defeated and set at naught. Yeah. Now, a lot of people can't stand that. You know, they love their church and uh, they still seek uh, the triumphant Messiah, you know. Mm -hmm and to think uh, that they have put their trust in a Messiah which can be set at naught by the secular agencies of the world and ignored uh, and run down. Uh, they don't want to run that risk and uh, therefore they sit on the other side of the fence. The release of atomic power and its implications have created a totally new society with totally new problems problems much more painful, uh, much more devastating than before. Therefore, the morality which the church endorses has got to be one, a much more flexible morality. Uh, it's, it's, it's got to be one which is tested, time tested, in the areas of world activity and in the life of men and women, and not just a reflection of dogmatic doctrinaire positions, the Particularly theological that positions. Particularly might have been 50 the years church, ago. Right that, that it might have been, just because the church said it 50 years ago was enough to make a whole lot of people listen and in a way behave, no more. The church does not anymore have that authority, or at least it has the authority, but it cannot exercise it in the same way in which it did previously. Now, the church can only exercise an authority if it bears in its body the marks of the Lord Jesus. If it has itself been crucified, in the marketplace. And unless it is as just as it proclaims its gospel to be. Mm. Now, the pursuit of justice. Justice is the corporate face of love. You know, love has many faces in a way. Uh, people can love each other individually. But to love corporate society is extremely difficult so that to seek justice in corporate society, it is about as close as Christian love can get to mm. society. What the church can do and must do in order to exhibit as best it can the kind of love reflected in that declaration, God so loved the world, is to see that justice is enacted in society for all men and women, whoever they are. Now, when the church adopts this as its mission, then it begins to understand how it's related to the Lord Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection. It can relate itself in a certain sense, theologically, uh, metaphysically in a way, doctrinally in a way, but it can only get at the deep resources and power and meaning of the Christian faith by its own crucifixion in service 